So today's presentation is called Platform 7 Unleashed. In talking about 7.0, we do have a brand new interface that's coming out. This release has been two years in development. That's a longer period of time than we've ever gone between releases since our initial release of the product in 1999. This version begins shipping on March 3rd. That actually corresponds perfectly to the beginning of our roadshow, the Relevance Roadshow, that starts March 3rd in Seattle. The Relevance Roadshow will uh, run from March 3rd to April or to May 1st, and it'll be your opportunity to see the product template uh, uh, technology that we're going to be talking about here today with Relevance uh, live. Today's presentation will be basically a slide presentation on the relevance portion of it. We will do a demonstration of the 7.0 product interface upgrades. If you are currently a PMP user, which means you're on the platform maintenance plan, you will get a free upgrade from your 6.0 to your 7.0 version. So you'll get that in the mail sometime around the middle of March. The CDs will begin shipping the week of March 3rd, and you should see it somewhere around the first or second week of March. If you're interested in purchasing the new 7.0 product, it will be at the same price as Thin Major 6.0. Reach out to your local value-added reseller in your area. If you don't know who that is, just go online at thinmanager.com, and you can find them there. Now, what are the interface changes? This is a substantial new look and feel to the uh, Thin Manager product. The management interface looks uh, significantly different. We've added a ribbon bar across the top, similar to what you'd see in Excel. A Thin Manager toolbar on the left-hand side, similar to what you would see on Outlook. We've added the ability to tear away the tabs so you can work on different portions of the interface simultaneously in different windows. We've also added a quick access toolbar for items that you do often. And we've added the ability to change the theme of the interface and the tab theme as well. So there are some pretty substantial interface changes that we've made, and I want to go ahead and show those to you. So I'm going to bring up my beta version that I've been working with here for the last couple of weeks. This is the new interface. As you can see, it looks substantially different than the previous interface. I'm going to slide this little bar over here. Where we've got on our uh, left-hand side the Thin Miniature toolbar. We now have things broken up into icons on the bottom. So you have your Thin Manager connection, your terminals, your display servers, your display clients, your users, and now for the relevance technology, we've got the location list. So if you're clicked on the Thin Manager server, you can select which server you want to connect to. If you're clicked on terminals, obviously you're going to see your list of terminals. If you want, you can pull each one of these up into toolbar bars that you can select from, so you can navigate a little quicker. If I click on users, it'll give my list of users in a drop down. So in my environment, I have a single uh, Thin Manager server called Primary, a list of terminals, iPad operator, X multi monitor, and Z multi station. I got a list of display servers under my terminal servers. I have primary, secondary, and VHMI03, which is actually a virtualized terminal server. And then two cameras in my environment, access left and D-link behind. I then have a list of display clients. In that list, I have terminal server display clients, camera display clients, terminal uh, shadow display clients, and workstation display clients. And I have my list of users, maintenance, supervisor, and supply. I have no locations currently. I'm not going to be showing you the relevance technology today in a, in a presentation. I'll be talking about it with my slide technology or with my slide presentation, but the actual demonstration of the technology is really quite difficult to do online since it is a mobility technology. I then again have my uh, VMware virtualized servers. In this case, I have a single data center on an ESXi server that has two builds, a virtualized terminal server and a virtualized XP workstation box. So I've got the ability to navigate through each one of these components pretty quickly with my Outlook toolbar-like Thin Manager toolbar. And then if I click on any one of these independently, like the operator terminal, I can then see my list of tabs, configuration, modules, schedule, properties, event log, report, and shadow on the right-hand side. So I still have those same tabs. The difference is I now have the ability to tear away tabs. Okay, So I'm just going to pull that away and then place it back, and we'll get back to that in a moment. Now, as I move into each one of these areas on the Thin Manager toolbar, I also get across the top these menu items. And in the menu items, as I click on each, you'll see that 
each one of the menu items associated with the, out, the Thin Manager toolbar item that I'm t connected to will be either enabled or disabled. So if I'm clicking on an operator terminal, then in my ribbon bar, I'll be able to calibrate the touch screen, send a message, reboot or restart the terminal, enable or disable it, and then clear the event log for the terminal. So if I go to view, I'll be able to view reports for the terminal. I can go to remote view and change my connection not options, my scalability, my interactivity. So I've got the, you know, these items across the top, which used to be drop downs, are now shown in my ribbon bar across the top. So very easy access. If there are things that I do often, like with an operator terminal here, I might, uh, I might restart it or calibrate the touch screen. I can actually go to this uh, customizable quick access toolbar at the top, put a list of commands that I want to be, uh, to, that I want to appear across the top, and then I can get to them very quickly. Right now, the list of commands I have are calibrate touch screen, restart terminal, and send message. Um, by menu option, I have the list here, so I could go to tools, and this is the list of tool items that I can select and move into my quick access bar. So, for instance, with this operator terminal, if I wanted to send a message, I have this quick access, I so just click on it, and it sends a message, like I can say hello, and if you see the shadow of my screen, it'll say hello. And I'm interactively shadowing, so I can click on it. So I've got the quick access, I've got the ribbon bar across the top, which gives me quicker access to my menu items. I've got the Outlook toolbar-like Thin Miniature toolbar on the left-hand side, which allows me to move through. That way, I mean, if you have a very large tree, which many of our customers do, you don't have all the servers, terminals, display servers, display clients all laid out in one big tree. You can actually get section by section. It makes it much easier to manage. If it uh, needs more space in the left-hand side, you can simply slide these bars down, and they become icons at the bottom. And again, I'm going to talk about this tearaway function. So I'm on the operator terminal. I can actually tear away the terminal shadow and put that anywhere I want. I can actually put it back on the screen with my docking feature, right? So I can actually see two things at once, like the event log or, say, the configuration, simultaneous to, the, to seeing the shadow. When I'm done, I can pull the shadow back off and set it back up in this tab list up at the top. I can also change the order of my tab list. I can simply move the shadow item wherever I want it, okay, back and forth. If I peel it off while I'm on the operator terminal and then I lock it to the operator terminal, I could then set it aside and then I could go to, say, the multi-monitor terminal and I could pick the shadow item from the multi-monitor terminal. And now I've got a shadow of both. So I have my shadow of the operator terminal and shadow of the multi-monitor terminal and I could pull that one off as well. So I could put one shadow in the upper right, one shadow in the upper left, and I'm shadowing two terminals simultaneously. So you can, any tear away can be locked to its associated item like the terminal it's connected to or the display client or the display server. It can be locked to that and held on the screen. I could pull away as many shadows as I want. So really within Thin Miniature, we now have the ability to do multi-shadow. Once I'm done with these shadows, I can obviously pull them back down it back on the tab. I can pull this other one back down and unlock it, and it will slide back on the operator tab. So now I have the terminal operator tab for shadow, and I can go back and look at the shadow of the operator terminal. Just so you understand that this is actually shadowing the terminal, I can go in the display server side. I can set the camera axis left, hit the connect tab, and I'll show you on the left-hand side, there's my terminal right there. Actually, my terminal is down a little bit right here. And there's the terminal screen, which I was showing you with my shadow, okay? So I have the ability to kind of move this screen around in whatever format I like. So I could pull this off as well. Any one of the tabs I can pull off. And I could say, say if there's something I wanted to see all the time, I could just pull it off and lock it, keep it there. Also, if I go back into my, let's just pull it back up to terminals. If I go back to my terminals and I slip over here to view, you see how this uh, application, Thin Manager application now has kind of a blue theme to it. I can switch this over to an Office Black 2000. So I can change the look and feel. I can also change this, this tab selections across here. I can change the look and feel of those. I can say they're one note. That's a now a one look, note look. Or I could go to 3D rounded. Or I could go to flat, which that's not real pretty. I don't really like flat that much. 
but I like my tabs to be the 3D OneNote. That's kind of my favorite tab selection. So now you have the ability to kind of manage your interface. And as you move these things around, you can put them on the screen such that they're accessible in a much easier way for you. So I can tear configuration off, put it down here. Now I'm looking at three separate tabs simultaneously. These are the tabs I always need to see when I move through my terminals. These are the tabs that I can pull up as I switch between. So that is all of my technology in the interface that I wanted to show you. There are some other things in there that are in the plumbing. Uh, there is some stuff that connects it into uh, Active Directory now. will allow you to do a, a username, password lookup and verify that's okay. Um, and then there's some more Active Directory stuff that's going to be coming uh, further on down the road in some peak releases and additional releases under the 7 uh, series products. So be watching for those as well across the rest of the year. So interface changes, ribbon bar, thin manager toolbar, tearaway tabs, quick access toolbar, and themes and tabs. All right, so that's, that's just talk about, you know, although this is a significant change to the interface, um, it's just one component of the release. There is a, a substantial other component to this release that we're, we're coming out with on uh, March 3rd. So you're going to get 7.0, and you're also going to have a new product available to you called Relevance. Now, Relevance is about mobility. And when we talk about mobility, I like to start out with kind of a discussion about the tablet technology. And, and, and I want everybody to be aware that, you know, we don't, we feel that tablets are going to make it into the major manufacturing environment, not because we created a product that makes it useful in the environment, but because people are socially and, and, and you know, personally using tablet devices at home. They're, they're using them at home to watch Netflix in bed. They're using them at home to do their email. They're using them at home uh, for their kids to play games. They're taking them on vacation. You hand it to your kid, and, and they watch a movie in the back of the car, or they they uh, play a game in the back of the car. The point is, is that the driving factor behind the, the uptake on tablet devices, it's not, oh, well, we need to use it on the plant floor. It's, no, I'm already using it at home. Now, how can it be used on the plant floor? Now, when we talk about the, the uptake of the tablet technology, I want you to take a look at this, this report that uh, Gardner put out in June of last year. This is just June of last year, and this is Gardner. Gardner is, is a rather conservative uh, compiler of figures in the marketing research firm, and they, they compile their figures, they go out and they do research, and they say, okay, this is what the unit shipments in thousands of worldwide of uh, devices under PC, ultra mobile, tablet, and mobile phone look like in 2012 and so far in 2013 and what they're going to look like in 2014. And if you take a look at this, what you're going to see is that the tablet devices are going to outsell PCs, and that's both desktop and notebooks, by the end of 2014. Now, if you look at some of the other research firms like Zona Research or IDC, they're telling us that that's already happened. Um, in fact, most of them will tell you that in the month of December in 2013, that Tablets sold all far out, sold PCs and, and desktops and notebooks. Obviously, that was because of Christmas, and it's pretty pretty popular to buy a tablet and give it to your kids, or buy a tablet for dad or mom, and they can use it around the house. But the driving motivating factor behind that is things like Netflix, uh, you know, things like you know playing games, uh, you know, uh, Angry Birds. It's not about using it on the plant floor. But here's what happens. You are a leader in your company. You're a plant manager. You're a VP of engineering. You're a, you're a C-level uh, in, in, in your uh, company, and you manufacture consumer products. You go home, and you use uh, an iPad. Your kids use an iPad. Your wife uses an iPad. You know, maybe your husband uses an iPad if you're you know, um, using it for Netflix, using it for um, Angry Birds, using it for Cut the Rope, using it for magazines that you perhaps now have coming electronically. Its convenience is from the, the Netflix side. Its convenience is not, I'm, I'm driven to use it because I want to use it on the plant floor. It's, it's driven to you, kind of the cart before the horse. It's driven to you because you can use it comfortably in your home environment. And, and then once you've sat in bed with it and said, well, gosh, that was pretty cool. I had to watch, watch, you know, 
an episode of Psych uh, on Netflix, wouldn't this be great in my work environment? Now, why would I carry the device? Well, I'd, I'd keep the device around me. I'd keep it with me because it's very convenient for doing mail, email, and, and for doing you know videos, watching videos, and, and for checking my investments in Fidelity. I carry it because of that, but once I carry it, then I've got a whole new world of possibilities. And maybe I'm, I'm the, the VP of engineering and, and for a large company, and I say, wow, how do we make this work inside the plant? And, and let me tell you, from experience, recently I've spent a lot of time with very large companies who have created uh, groups who are looking in to the viability of mobile devices on the plant floor, tablet devices specifically. It's harder to do mobile phone, obviously, because of the screen real estate, but tablets specifically and saying, what about iPads on the, uh, on the play floor? What about Android devices on the play floor? And they've put together this group to basically decide, does this make sense? And, and the argument that I would have is it was driven by that home use, by the commercial use, by the, by the user in bed, by the user at, at home uh, eating dinner and, and perhaps reading the newspaper on their iPad. It wasn't driven by the idea that, oh, I've got all the answers to the plant floor and I know how I'm going to use mobility. This is what we call an inflection point. This is the point at which the acceptance of the device is driven by all the other things. Now let's make the device useful for what we need it for. This is a change in direction overall. Now what I'm, what I'm advocating here is not you go to the plant floor, you strip out all your thin clients and your workstation PCs, and you replace them all with iPads and Android devices. That's, that's not going to happen. That's not the way this process is going to happen. This is going to be a mixed-use environment. This is going to be where we use what we already have. So we've got thin clients. If you're a thin manager, you've got a lot of thin clients on your plant floor. These are the stationary tether devices. They're hooked into the Ethernet cable. They don't move. They're, they're powered with you know 110. And those things, those tethered devices, stay where they are. The applications that you're running on those thin clients probably have to do with where they're located, right? So that mixed-use environment will take what's already there, thin clients, full-blown workstations, workstations run as fat clients, and it'll add to it the ability to go mobile. So what you need is a solution that supports both, right? You need a solution that supports both technologies, the fixed, tethered device technology, and the mobile device technology. What's this look like? Well, let's, let's build, for the sake of understanding how this looks, let's build Lemonade Factory. So in our Lemonade Factory, we're going to make just one version of Lemonade. We'll just say it's going to be Lemonade. Uh, it's going to be yellow Lemonade, not pink Lemonade. It's just going to be Lemonade. And we've got in our uh, Lemonade Factory, we've got four zones that we're going to talk about. Cleaning, filling, and capping, labeling, and packing. So you clean bottles, you fill the bottles, you cap them, you label them, and you pack right? So these four zones are where we do our business. Now, I know there are a lot of things that go into, you know, shipping lemonade, but we're just going to look at these just to keep it easy. And in these four zones, we're going to assume that we already have, because we're going to create a mixed use environment, we're going to assume we already have on the left-hand side a thin client. It's an LCD embedded thin client, or maybe it's inside an enclosure, and there's a, a brick thin client inside of it with an LCD on the front. And then on the right-hand side, I've got an industrialized PC. Now, this could be a fat client, that's connecting to terminal servers and running the applications, or it could be running the applications locally on a workstation. Okay? So in our environment, we have an operator, and the operator needs to manage the environment in the cleaning zone. Maybe they're specific to the cleaning zone, but maybe they go across all four zones. Right? So our operator, if they're in the cleaning zone, needs access to the cleaning zone HMI. So I've just got a representation of a cleaning zone HMI display here. Right? And in a terminal server environment, the cleaning zone HMI is going to run on the terminal server and be viewed on the terminal, right? That's kind of the technology that we've brought to bear here. We deliver terminal server applications as well as IP cameras and shadows of other terminals, et cetera. But we deliver terminal server sessions from the terminal servers to the clients. So we're a content delivery system in that respect, but we're delivering from the terminal server to the client for the operator to use in the cleaning zone. And then somewhere along the line, we added a technology we call Term Secure, where you could add a user to the environment, and then the user had things they had to manage. Like in this case, I've, I add to the packing zone a motor, and the user is the maintenance person. And to do the job, the function of managing or working with the motor, they need something like a motor schematic, 
Maybe that's a PDF, maybe that's a JPEG. It runs inside the terminal or terminal server environment. It may be stored on a disk somewhere there. It's brought up and maybe viewed through a PDF viewer or a JPEG viewer of some sort. So they can look at the schematic and know how the motor works. And then if they're going to need to gain access to the content, like the motor schematic or the work order system, they authenticate to an existing terminal, for instance, the terminal that's in the cleaning zone. When they authenticate, their content gets added to the content of the terminal. So the terminal content is just the HMI display for the cleaning zone. When they authenticate there, when they log in, it says, oh, there's a maintenance user that's now here and wants to use this terminal to gain access to the motor schematic or the work order system or whatever it is. So this is where we add term secure to this environment, right? We've already got this product. 60XLI, 50 had that technology in it. But this is content, right, the cleaning HMI, the motor schematic, being delivered to the terminal device or to the user, right, if the user authenticates the terminal. Obviously, a user cannot display without being authenticated to the terminal because the terminal is your display, right? So here we have content delivery, and that's really what we're talking about here. Thin Manager as a content delivery system, delivering content to either the device or to the user who's authenticated. So when you talk about ownership of content, the user owns content, the device owns content, right? When you go mobile, things change. Because the users have with them their devices, perhaps at all times, and they're always authenticated to them. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of set the stage here. In, in the relevance environment, the idea is that you're gonna have a, a, just a plain old iPad or Android device, it's gonna be maybe sitting on a desk in the maintenance shop uh, charging. And it's, it belongs to nobody. You walk up, you pick it off the charger, and you authenticate as a maintenance user. Hi, I'm, 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 I'm Janet, the, the maintenance user who works on the plant floor. I'm Bob, the maintenance user that works on the plant floor. I log in as Bob, and it says, okay, this device, this iPad, this Android device is now owned by or controlled by or with or part of Bob or Janet. Right? And the cool thing about that is that those users, those maintenance users, when they authenticate to the device, they became like cyborgs. Because what you've done now is you've added technology to the person, technology like the camera. Well, what's that mean? Well, that means they can take videos, they can provide video images to somebody else, they can take pictures, they can scan things. That's a very interesting technology. Um, they probably have a GPS system inside of that device, like an iPad has GPS support if it's one of the the uh, uh, external-based uh, units that works with AT&T wireless, so it's going to have GPS. It, it probably handles Wi-Fi. Well, it always handles Wi-Fi, or it wouldn't work. It's got probably has Bluetooth, which pretty much all of them do. It may have near-field communication like most Android devices now have, right? And, and actually, um, iPads are very soon going to have uh, beacon-based technology and near-field communication. So it's got all these different functions that you're now authenticated to a user, you're now adding to the user because they're carrying it, they're authenticated to it, and they're now kind of a cyborg, the combination of an iPad or Android device and a person. And they move throughout the environment, okay? So you're going mobile, we're gonna change the paradigm. We're not delivering content to a device or user anymore. We're not associating content with a device or user. Remember, the device is stationary, right? The thin client, it's probably tethered to the floor, and you were delivering the HMI to the device, so the device kind of owned the HMI. So if you were in the, in the cleaning area, you're going to deliver the HMI for cleaning, and that was going to go only to the device, and the device wasn't going to go anywhere. Well, now you're moving around, so we're going to change the paradigm here. The new paradigm is about about. It's about about. Because look, the cleaning HMI is not about the terminal device, just as the schematic for the motor is not about the user, the maintenance user, right? It's not about the maintenance user. The cleaning HMI is about the cleaning zone. It's about what's going on in the cleaning zone, all right? So that content is about the cleaning zone, just as the schematic is about the motor. So we're going to assign content to what we call locations. And we're going to say that the cleaning zone is a location, the motor is the location. So in a relevance environment, you're going to assign all of these different zones or devices 
you're going to assign them as locations. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to create a location hierarchy. Remember, we have a lemonade factory. So what's the biggest location in the lemonade factory? Well, it's the factory itself. And within the factory, you have other locations, right? And each location, as you move down the tree, the hierarchy of locations, each one is greater granularity, more resolution into your environment. So in the lemonade factory, you could have multiple lines. We're just saying we have one line. But in our one line, we have cleaning. Well, that's a location within the lemonade factory. It's actually a location within the line within the lemonade factory. Fill and cap, that's a location, labeling, and packing. And then within labeling, let's say we had a control logics PLC. Or within packing, we had that pack and bear motor, right? So these are different locations within the location hierarchy of the entire lemonade factory. And if you're within packing, you know that within packing, you have a pack conveyor motor. If you're at the conveyor motor, you know you're within packing. If you're at the conveyor motor, you actually know you're within packing, and packing was within the lemonade factory. So you're able to resolve as you move down to the tree to each one of these children within the tree. You're able to, re the resolution at which you're resolving your location gets more and more granular. Okay, so we've created a location hierarchy. Then we're going to have all this content. So in a, we're, I'm just giving you examples. So in the, in the Lemonade Factory, we've got a cleaning HMI, a packing HMI, a pack motor schematic, a pack drive manual, a work order system, so work order software system, and a control logics uh, PLC programming software. Okay? So that's, that's the content I'm just going to work with here. And what we're going to do is we're going to assign content to locations. You actually, within the relevance to the manager interface, you actually do create content, create locations, and assign content locations. So the cleaning HMI is about the cleaning zone. So we're going to assign the cleaning HMI to the cleaning zone. The packing HMI is about the packing zone. We're going to assign the packing HMI to the packing zone. The pack motor schematic and the pack drive manual are really about the conveyor motor. So we're going to assign those to the conveyor motor. The work order system, it doesn't have an assignment. You can see there's no, there's no line going from there to anywhere. Why? Well, this is interesting. This kind of harkens back to term secure. The work order system is an interesting beast because the work order system is more personalized. It's personalized content. It's specific to a type of user. And that user type would be anybody who's in maintenance who can actually order parts, right? Or can tag out a, an item or can fix things. So there's people within maintenance own the work order system. It's, it's akin to this. Where do you deliver your email? Well, you deliver it to individuals. It's personal. You don't deliver my email to somebody else. So when you're assigning content, which is email, to a location, there's no location to assign it to. You assign it personally to a person. So the idea of having a user and assigning content to a user still exists. It's not that you just sign content to locations. You can assign content to users. So what that means is, any maintenance person could get access to the work order system, okay? Now, they might use it for a myriad of different reasons, but they need access to it for all kinds of different devices or locations. Control logic software, obviously, it's used to program a control logic PLC. So that would be assigned to the control logic PLC, which could actually be within the labeling zone, if you will. So this is assigning content to locations. Now, when I'm this cyborg, when I'm this person who is authenticated to an iPad or to an Android device, how do I know where this person is? I have to resolve their location, okay? So we use what we call resolvers. And there are five different types of resolvers that I'm going to talk to you about today. There's QRC, Quick Response Code. You've seen them. They're like little scan labels. They're all over the world. They're everywhere. They're on, and people put them on their business cards now. It's, it's much better than a barcode. It can contain more information. It's easier to get a scan from. And you can use your iPhone or your iPad to scan these things very easily. Near-field communication, that's a little, little transceiver item that you have to get within about 30 inches of. You have to kind of push your device up next to it to, to register that it's there. And it can give you information much like a QR code can. Bluetooth beacon, obviously, that's, that's like a, a, a broadcast uh, piece of information. Um, it can actually be a transceiver, so it can talk back to you. But it's going to have a range that's, you know, maybe 300 meters. So you're going to fall within a Bluetooth range. GPS, obviously, that's external, and that uses satellites to figure out where you are. 
And uh, you can also do wireless, and, and you can use Wi-Fi and the SSID to figure out where you are, the MAC address of the Wi-Fi device, to figure out where you are in an even broader range, so it goes even further than Bluetooth. Those QRC, NFC, Bluetooth beacon, um, and Wi-Fi, by default, those are going to be internal positions. That's, you're going to use them inside. Now, you could use QRC, NFC, even Bluetooth outside, but more commonly, um, you're going to be resolving great big areas outside. You're going to use something like GPS. So there's internal positioning. There's external positioning. There is active resolvers. Active resolver means like a QR code. I had to scan it. I had to actively scan it. Or NFC, I had to put it right up next to it. And then there's passive, Bluetooth, GPS, and Wi-Fi. You're just walking around, and you enter a Bluetooth area, and it resolves you. Okay? It figures out where you are based on how that Bluetooth was assigned to location. So it resolves by assigning resolvers to location, and then you actually enter a location and are resolved to be where that location is, right? So we've got applying the resolvers. Now, th there's, there's a reason why you would use different types of resolvers. A QR code is going to give you a very great, very detailed resolution. You can resolve to one square inch if you wanted to with the QR code. You just put on a one square inch QR code on a, on a, put it on a, a, a mouse. Um, you could put it on an encoder. You could put it on a limit switch. You could put it anywhere. And it could resolve that scan right to that location. And, and remember, because we created a hierarchy, when you resolve to, say, a motor, it can be resolved to say, I'm at the motor, which is inside of the packing zone, which is inside of the plant. So it can resolve all the way down the tree, right? You're going to apply resolvers based on how big the area is. So the cleaning zone might require a Bluetooth. I mean, it doesn't have to. You could actually for, uh, create an active resolver that you scanned, and it was somewhere plastered up on, on, on some panel, and it said, when you resolve this QR code, then you're in the cleaning area. But if you wanted to be passive, so it just did it for you, you could use Bluetooth, and the Bluetooth could say, okay, when you get within this range, you're considered to be in the cleaning area. So I can resolve a great big area. Then within that cleaning area, I can also resolve tighter. I could have devices or locations within the cleaning area that resolve me even tighter. And you're resolving to these things to do two things. Establish where the user is and deliver content based on where they are. Okay? So if I'm in the cleaning zone, I need content associated with the process of cleaning. Right? I don't need the packing HMI if I'm in the cleaning zone. So if it can resolve me, I get through all the red tape of, here, just give me all the HMI, I need all the HMI, and I'll figure out what I need to see on my iPad or on my Android device. No, no, no. Here's what you need where you are. So it establishes where you are, locates you, and it resolves that location to assigned content and says, here's the content I need to deliver. When you enter here, you get this content. And it's, it's actually got one step further in there that I don't mention here in the slide. Who are you? Are you supposed to have content associated with a motor if you're an operator? Maybe that's only for the maintenance user skill set. So you're actually, within relevance, able to create a skill set and say, these people belong in this skill set. So when you scan the QR code on this motor, it's going to deliver you the schematic and the manuals for the motor, but you have to be a maintenance person. It's not going to deliver you the schematic for the motor if you're just an operator because you wouldn't know what to do with that anyways, right? So it resolves who you are, where you are, and what you need. So it's what you need, where, when you need it. Okay? So you're, you're, the concept of relevance is that delivery of what you need, where, you, when you need it. Why would we do that? Well, remember I said you got a VP who comes down and says, look, I, I don't know how we're going to do it, but I've been using this iPad at home, and it's awesome. I love it. We need to use this on the plant floor. It's got to have some value here. Well, here's the deal. If you just say, well, we've got this content delivery system that can deliver HMI to the iPad. Is that good? Well, that's good, but what if I'm clearing in a lock? So what if I'm changing recipes? Is it okay to just, whenever I enter the building and get on the Wi-Fi, all of a sudden you deliver me the visualization tool, and I'm not even at the process? Is it okay that I'm not in the process and I can change the recipe? Is it okay that I can start and stop the machine? Is it okay that I can clear interlocks? No. Just delivering the content is not good enough. You have to know where the user is 
know who they are and what they're capable of doing, and then deliver the content based on what they're supposed to have, where they are. You can't start a machine or clear interlocks when you're in the maintenance area if you can't even see the machine. You've got to be at the machine. We give you that ability with relevance. Now, when you resolve to a location and you're going to deliver content, there are three different ways you can deliver it. If there is existing content in your environment, for instance, let's say you're in the cleaning zone, right? And you have an HMI that's on the far left-hand side of the cleaning zone. And on the far right-hand side, you have the area where the jets go down to the bottle, bottles, they squirt the water, and, and uh, maybe there's a liquid detergent in there or something that helps clean the bottles, and they flip it over. Let's say you have a problem with that as an operator because some of the bottles aren't coming out clean. What you know is, well, probably one of the jets is bad, but I don't know which one because it's a linear process that runs very fast. And there's 24 jets. I don't know which one is bad, but I know one bottle each time it goes through is coming out unclean. So how do I figure out which one of those jets have to be fixed? Well, I don't. I call the maintenance person. They come out to the line. And what they would normally do would be manually control, visually inspect. But the problem is I can't manually control from a terminal that's on the far left-hand side of the process and visually inspect at the same time those jets that are on the far right-hand side of the process 50 or 100 yards away. So what do I have to do? Well, I'd probably get another maintenance person or ask the operator to actually push the button to do the, the, that process manually one jet at a time, and then I would look at each one. It was hit jet one, and that was okay. Hit jet two, and I'd be calling back and forth. Wouldn't it be great if I could just take that manual control process from the HMI, so take the HMI off of the terminal, and then move down the line to where the visual inspection was, and that's what we offer through transfer. You can transfer content off of the terminal and onto the iPad or Android device, move down the line, then control it while you're visually inspected, then release the content, and it will go back to its default location, which is the operator's terminal. So that's one way you can do it. Or you can clone content. So you could say, well, there's an HMI session running on a terminal server. I want my own HMI session running on the terminal server. So you can clone content. This actually applies where perhaps you don't even have a visualization station in the zone. And all you want to do is scan a QR code when you get to the zone or enter the zone, and it delivers you a session. Well, it would have to clone off the configuration under the manager and create a session for you. That's a clone. What if you were an operator and you wanted to leave the session on the terminal, but you want to have a shadow of it? Or let's say you were a, a, there were two operators on the line. One of the operators is pretty darn new, and the other one's been there for years. And the one that's been there for years is going to go take a 15-minute break, but he's concerned when he leaves that this other operator is not going to know what to do. So all you got to do is walk up, get a shadow of your terminal that your, your second user is using who's uh, kind of unsure. Get a shadow of it by, say, scanning a QR code. It'll deliver a shadow to your iPad. Go to the break room with the iPad, and it delivered to you a non-interactive. You can't push buttons or anything, but you can see the screen that your operator with, with less, you know, ears on the floor who doesn't know exactly what they're doing can be showing you their screen while they're on the floor and you're not. And then if there's something that goes wrong, they can call you and say, hey, I'm on the screen, I don't know which button to push. And you're there in that break room, and you can say, well, I can see that you've got to push this button, then this button, and you've done them in the wrong order. So you can actually shadow to be able to support on a mobile device while you're away. And then when you go back, you just release the shadow, and you're back to work with your terminals. So it's working in conjunction with the existing thin manager terminals that are already in the environment. It's a mixed-use environment. We're not talking about swapping all the devices out. We're talking about using them together. And that's what Relevance does. It gives you that ability to use these together to migrate to this concept of, yes, mobility adds value, but you can't just give everything to everybody at any time and anywhere they are. Okay, so we apply the resolvers. Let's give an example of this. So in this case, we're resolving transfer. I've got my operator here inside this yellow circle, right? And there's a QR code that's on the terminal itself. The terminal is running the HMI application on the terminal server. Well, what I need is I need to walk up as the operator. I scan that QR code. And what it does for me is it transfers that content from the terminal to me. Now I can walk down the line, do my manual inspection or manual control visual inspect. Then when I'm done, I simply release it and it goes back to the terminal. What about resolving clone? This is where my maintenance person 
goes out to the floor, and perhaps there's something wrong. There's a fault on the, on the motor. They scan the QR code. It starts a session. It clones off the session configuration that Thin Manager has set for that particular location and says, for that location, you need the motor schematic. It then delivers the motor schematic to that device for the maintenance person right there where they need it right out on the floor where they need it. I mean, you can do all kinds of electronic clipboards. You can do localized calibration. There's all kinds of things in reference materials, et cetera. You could go to, uh, say, the PLC. You could scan the PLC code, and it could deliver to you, or it could start another clone session of the PLC programming software. And you could look at uh, maybe some interlocks that were, that were running the PLC. You could even load a new piece of PLC code into the PLC. Maybe you've got a break. You run out there. Instead of having to do it from a remote location, you can do it right there where you can see what's going on with the PLC. Bluetooth. This is really cool. So you got a Bluetooth range within which you enter in the cleaning zone, and as soon as you enter it, it delivers you the cleaning HMI. It can either deliver one that already exists, so you reconnect to it, or it can start a new clone session and deliver it to you. It can even transfer whatever you need it to do when you enter the range. It does it automatically. Now, there's one other thing I want to talk to you about. When we are talking about resolving location, remember I said resolving location to be able to deliver content, but also resolving location to know where your users are. How do we figure out where users are today? How do we figure out where people on the plant floor are today? If somebody were to call from the front office and say, hey, Bob, where are you on the plant floor? Right over the phone. What would Bob say? Would Bob say, well, I'm 40 feet from the north wall and 20 feet from the west wall? What Bob would do is he would use landmarks, like he'd say, I'm in zone one. I'm in the cleaning zone. I'm in the packing zone on line one. I'm in the packing zone on the uh, uh, pink lemonade line. And that would resolve for you, in your mind, that would tell you, okay, I know where they're located because I, I have a reference point now, a landmark that tells me where they are. And you can immediately go out and find Bob without having to look. You can walk right to where you need to go. Kind of like if, if I were anywhere in the country, right, I could be anywhere. I'm, I'm sitting in Alpharetta, Georgia right now at our offices, but I could be anywhere in the country. You could call me. and Let's say I was under the Hollywood sign in, in Burbank. I could say, hey, I'm under the Hollywood sign, and you would immediately know, oh, I know you're near Los Angeles. I think it's in Burbank. And I know what the, in my mind, I know what the Hollywood sign is. And you could basically resolve where I was in, in, across the entire world. I could say I'm under the Eiffel Tower. You know I'm at the Eiffel Tower. You could you know, say, well, that's in France. I know where, I know where that is. And you can use that to resolve my location. So when you put a Bluetooth beacon on there, and it resolves you automatically, you just walk into range, it resolves you and says, OK, you've now entered the cleaning zone. It also, on the Thin Miniature interface, puts you on the location hierarchy. And it says, Bob, or Fred, or Matt, in my case, is in the cleaning zone. If you resolve within the cleaning zone, if you scan a code, like a QR code, that was on, let's say, a jet on the cleaning mechanism, right? It's on jet number five, and you scanned it because you wanted to find out about that information as a maintenance user. Not only does it resolve the content to tell you, well, here's your work order system, so you can order that part, but here's information about the part, so you know what to order. It also is telling the system, hey, by the way, not only is that maintenance person, Fred, in the cleaning zone, they're actually standing at this particular piece of machinery. It could be a motor, it could be an encoder, it could be a light, it could be a button, it could be anything, PLC, and you can figure out where people are on the plant. What happens from this is, in the next release, which we're already working on the specification for, version 2.0 of relevance, you're going to have the ability to recognize events. We're going to create an API that allow you to recognize events in your environment. Then go out and say, well, I've got a fault on a motor, Based on the fact that it's a motor and it's got a fault, I'm going to need a maintenance person. And I want to pick the closest maintenance person. Show me all the resolves and tell me within the tree who's closest to the particular motor that just faulted. So you're going to be able to do event-based resolving and say, deliver the content and a message to this person that says, hey, this motor faulted. You're the closest to it. Can you go take care of it? If they say yes, deliver them the reference material they need to fix the problem, plus the work order system they were a part of, whatever they need to fix the problem, and let them resolve it. If they can't, then it goes in and says, well, you're the closest, but the next closest person, since you can't fix it, is 200 yards away at this location. Hey, can you fix it? And if they say yes, then they move over and fix it. So it's the ability to not just 
deliver content based on resolution of location, but also to know where people are and to be able to deliver content based on where they are, even though they haven't authenticated to anything specifically, but because an event occurred. So be watching for that in Relevance 2.0. Now, this Relevance product, again, is, is it's something you really need to see in action to understand, and that's why we're doing this Relevance Roadshow. What I've done right now is I've given you a lot of theory. I, I'm not, I don't have the ability over the Internet to demonstrate the ability to walk up and do a scan and, and have the stuff delivered, but it is live. It does work, and what we're doing is we're going mobile with the technology. We're going to hit 22 sites around the country. If you want to see what those sites are, you go to www.finminiature.com forward slash roadshow or you go to forward slash events. Either one of those will take you to the ability to register for a location around your area. Okay, and there's 22 different locations starting in Seattle on the 3rd of March. So it starts the very day that we release Relevance. We'll be doing our first roadshow with it. It's two and a half hours of presentation. It will also include some basic technology, uh, about an hour of basic technology, introducing the new interface in 7.0, talking about how to set up and configure Pin Manager but then very quickly moving on to a real-life environment. And, and our real-life environment is the beverage factory. And you'll be able to see how these things happen, how the resolvers work. We'll have the QR codes. We'll have the Bluetooth technology. You'll be able to see how these resolvers work, how we deliver content, how we get those who need the information, the content, the information they need, where and when they need it. And so if you really want to see it work so that you could say, okay, I know we got this group who's supposed to figure out what to do with, with these iPads and Android devices, and I know we've got the leaders of the company are saying, we got to look into this mobility thing. Now I'm going to go find out what it looks like and how it should work, and then I can go back and talk intelligently about how we can use it. You'll be able to see this technology and say, I know where we can use this. I know how this could work. So the technology release is March 3rd. There's one more thing I want to say about this roadshow. When you see us in the roadshow, you're going to see us in this vehicle. We're actually traveling the entire country in a 1970 Cadillac built. For those of you who are Dukes of Hazzard's fan, that's what Boss Hogg drove around in, in 1970. He had one of these things, and this is what we have, 70 for 7.0. We're going to drive this around the country. When we get to Atlanta, we're going to give the thing away. So register for the roadshow. Get yourself an opportunity to see the technology and perhaps to drive away in this particular device right here. Um, it's actually um, totally redone. It is a convertible with brand new upholstery, brand new convertible, brand new paint job, uh, brand new work on every part of it, and um, you can come and see and touch it if you're interested in it. So, beginning March 3rd, uh, ending in, in uh, starting in Seattle, ending in Atlanta on uh, May 1st. Um, I'm going to check and see if we have any questions. I'm sure we do. Last few times that we've done this, we've had a number of questions. So I want to go in here and pull my. Yep, we do. Um, uh, uh, when will your registration open for North, uh, East, and East Roadshows? Thank you for that question. It will be about one week. I think we're finalizing the locations now. You should see this go active in about one week. With mobile content, have location aware security. You can't take photos in Area X. You can only view. Yes, um, we have uh, an API. It's, God, there's so much I can't really get into because I don't have the time. But, we have an API that you can place inside of your application that can control all of that. And, and you'll find that we, we do some very interesting things. We do something called fencing. Um, this is the ability to use um, multiple uh, things in con conjunction with each other for resolving. So you resolve into a, a broad area with Wi-Fi, and then within that, you resolve into Bluetooth. And the idea is that You've got to be within the Wi-Fi for the Bluetooth to work so that you can't duplicate, for instance, a Bluetooth code, adding security such that people cannot walk away with, um, you know, you can get a Bluetooth code generator for your, your mobile phone, and it takes Bluetooth beacon signal and sends it out, and then you're always carrying the beacon, so you're always in there. Um, we've also got the ability to do things like, let's say that um, you had to stop a process to fix a device, right? And then before you start it, you had to clear interlocks. We have the ability to make it, in fact, during the demonstration with the um, uh, Relevance Roadshow, you're going to see this. You have the ability to lock out unless they are actually at the location and scan the QR code to lock out the, the clear interlocks. So, so you can control that um, ability to kind of secure your environment. And there, there's all kinds of things that are built into that as well. 
With mobile content, I have a location aware security. You can't take photos in Area X. You can view content out. Right, you got it. You're exactly right with that. What is the effort involved to build the rules that determine the availability of apps in each area? Um, there, is a, there is an effort involved, and in, in the process really starts from um, figuring out what your content looks like how that will be assigned, so what locations do you need assigned to that content, and how you want to deliver it. Do you want to clone, do you want to transfer? Um, and that buildup, that effort, is, is really the, the first step in making this happen. I, well, really, the first step is deciding how do you want to apply the technology. Do I want to do my calibration um, by making it so that I can deliver the calibration application to the device? And so I've got an iPad, I want to deliver the calibration application, then maybe I want to go to the floor and I want to put a QR code on each one of my uh, my instruments that I'm going to calibrate. And so I put the QR code on there. And then when I walk out to the floor and get within, say, Bluetooth zone, it says, okay, now you're out on the floor. You're going to do calibration because you're the calibration person. That's who you logged in as. Here's the calibration application. And by the way, your, your focus point is on the, the model number of the, the device, the instrument that you're going to calibrate or the, the, the serial number. So you have a SKU number assigned to that, that particular device that needs to be calibrated. Then you walk up to the device and you scan the QR code and it wedges in that same SKU code and it says, oh, you're at this device. And it, that's the kind of thing that you're going to be able to do um, when you're, you're you know, putting this relevance into play, right? So you're going to have to say, well, what is it that I'm trying to do now? Who are my people involved? What are my locations involved? What's the content that I'm trying to deliver? Then when it's time to build that, Yes, there is a set of steps that you go through to build that. In fact, um, we're going to have a deployment guide. We have a beta effort going on right now. We have a gentleman named uh, David Gardner who's out there with this beta effort building the deployment guide that goes along with this. We have four major customers who are actually putting this into practice. And from that, we're building the deployment guide so that you can understand the steps to go through to build up your environment, your locations, your users, your, your, your transfer, clone, and, and shadow processes, all of those items, and your resolvers, how and where to put those. We have a number of different resolving technologies. The Bluetooth technologies are right now under our control because we have some very specific needs. So we actually are creating programmable Bluetooth options that you're going to be able to get beginning in March 3rd. So you'll go to our website and you'll be able to find those pieces of Bluetooth hardware and they'll be available through our channel as well so that you can say, I want to, I want to resolve in this broader range with Bluetooth. Obviously, QR codes you can generate yourself and assign those. And there is a set of steps that you go through to register QR codes into the software, to apply the QR codes to locations, to register Bluetooth items into the software, and to apply. It's very, very simple steps. Um, okay, I think that, whoop. What type of content can you deliver? Right now, um, the content on the version one of relevance is limited to the Windows-based applications under terminal services. Long term, we'll also be able to deliver the IP camera. Obviously, um, under the terminal service side, you can also deliver um, the virtualized technology. So in, in our content list right now, we have um, terminal service sessions to, that can be delivered under um, the major 6 Terminal service sessions, virtualized uh, terminal service sessions and workstation sessions, IP cameras, and shadows. Um, in the relevance version one, you're going to be able to deliver uh, terminal server sessions, um, well, you're going to be able to deliver all but IP cameras. We won't be able to deliver IP cameras probably until version 2 because on the client side, uh, we have some work yet to do on, on the IP camera technology, but you will be able to deliver your, your sessions, your applications. So you could deliver you know, work order system, your supply system, your, your maintenance system, your visualization, your data analytics, your statistical process analysis tools, all of that kind of stuff as well as your calibration software. You'll be able to deliver virtualized versions of any of that. You'll be able to deliver workstation views of any of that as well. So that's part one. Um, uh, just real quickly, um, also on the Android side, uh, the Android version of the relevance client will not be available March 3rd. It will come out in a, in a, a release, separate release, that comes out somewhere around the first part of the summer. We're looking at, at June right now. So if you're going to be testing this out, if you're interested in testing this out, um, you're going to be using iPads. We recommend that you use version, uh, well, there's only really two iPads available, version 2 and Air. Um, the, the iPad version 3, they had issues with their networking. That's why they took them off the market uh, fairly quickly. And we don't like how that networking works. It tends to disconnect too often for our good. 
Um, would you be able to get content from another area if it was a problem and you want? Yes. Um, they're asking if you want if you if you wanted to get content in an area that you're not. There is a function that you can do that kind of overrides the idea of, of, of resolving. Um, it gives you the ability to go into the, the location tree and to say, I, I want to initiate um, whatever content is that location. I want to transfer it. I want to clone it. or I want to shadow it. So you can do it through kind of a menuing. You still have to have you know, you know, the authority to do that. So you've authenticated as a user. It's only going to allow you to do it if that user has the ability to do it. So yes, you can do that. Um, okay, I think I've answered all those questions. If there are any other questions, um, hopefully our, our panelist has gotten those. Todd Garman has been online with me the whole time. And hopefully has got, he's gotten those. Um, we are going to be sending you out a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. And again, go online. If you want to see this stuff live, I, I tell you, it is, it is extremely cool to see, especially the Bluetooth stuff. It's really neat because, I mean, it just, the representation uh, is really, it's difficult to, you know, show slides and really get it. But when you're, when you see it active, it's, it's really exceptional. And when we do this, this roadshow presentation, you're going to see it all in an active environment. We'll have the QR codes, we'll scan, we'll transfer, we'll clone, we'll shadow, we'll Bluetooth, we'll, we'll fence, we'll do all that, those technologies that allow you to see and, and kind of really feel and grasp what the technology can do for you and then decide, okay, how might I use this in my environment and how can I talk to that? All right, ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate your time today. Um, thank you for joining me. I know your time is, uh, is precious and, and I know that, uh, you know, th this kind of presentation, there's a lot of meat to it. Um, you know, I'll be doing this presentation a couple more times before we get on the road. So if you want to watch it again or you want to send somebody to it, I think our next presentation is next Wednesday at 9 a.m. Eastern time. Thank you again for your time and have a great day.